Uh, well, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, very good to be here. I won't be up here on my own. Gosh, these, these are very... Navigating these is the first challenge. Um, so uh, I'd just bring up my panel as quickly as possible. Um, Kate Hampton, the Chief Executive of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Danai uh, Kiriakopoulou, who's the Head of Climate at the Bank of England. And Andrew Howell, who's the Senior Director of Sustainable Finance at the Environmental Defence Fund. Welcome, all of you. Um, our panel is about what economic uncertainty means for climate action in the next kind of couple of years. And just by way of a little bit of um, scene setting, I think many of us that are involved in the field of ESG and climate finance have found the last couple of years in a way quite tough and a bit disorientating. On the one hand, uh, we've all witnessed more and more extreme weather events, which may be extreme, but are also becoming scarily normal, predictably enough, the scientists warned us, and of course very costly. But on the other hand, we've seen a bit of a mini renaissance of the fossil fuel sector since early last year. Um, lots and lots of fresh investment in fossil fuel production and exploration, and certainly absolutely eye-watering profits in the sector. And alongside that, and I'd say driven by it, um, we've seen a sort of weakening of climate resolve in parts of the investment sector. And I'm, I'm thinking of things like the voting record of some of the world's largest asset managers um, at Share Action. We have a very good look each year at how you know, asset managers looking after millions of people's pensions are voting on things like climate-related shareholder proposals. And there's no doubt we've seen a, a real kind of weakening there. And meantime, of course, there's a lot of inflation, cost of living, which is both a foretaste of what climate change could, could wreak in terms of the impact on people's lives and the economy, but also a factor that risks weakening policy and political resolve on climate change. So these are quite challenging times. And I think after kind of a long period in which ESG had huge momentum and it was all go, 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 we're kind of now in choppier waters, if you like. So what we're going to talk about in the next um, half hour on this panel is how do we ensure that economic uncertainty doesn't hold us back from making the swift transition to a low-carbon and climate-resilient economy that we know is so urgently needed. And a couple of themes I just want to sort of uh, say, pick out, that we'll, we'll try and cover together. First is about the strength or otherwise of public policy around the world to act on climate change. Also want to look at the strength or otherwise of the global financial industry's commitment to climate action, including uh, central banks, financial supervisors, and so on. Third, the role of innovation and green technologies, which is obviously utterly critical to the journey we need to go on. And fourth, this whole question of accountability. How do we ensure that actors across the economy, including in finance, are held accountable to commitments that they have made? So let's start with Kate, if you're happy to kick us off, Kate. Um, Children's Investment Fund Foundation is, has a kind of incredible overview of a lot of this because you're supporting and financing funding um, really smart interventions in lots of areas of this space. Can you give a bit of your perspective from what you're seeing as a, as a funder, as a key funder, and also, um, yeah, your sense of how these kind of quite complex countercurrents, if you like, are, are influencing um, the degree of action? Um, so, yeah, thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, and so as a, as a philanthropy and funding mainly the not-for-profit sector and also working very closely with governments, we do see quite a lot of... Um, challenges, headwinds in terms of um, accelerating policy change um, in some geographies. And of course, a lot of that is extremely well funded by the fossil fuel lobby. Um, and I did have to laugh when um, our, our minister said that the UK doesn't subsidize fossil fuels, because I think we all know that that's wildly inaccurate. Um, but um, fossil fuel subsidies have actually increased over the last few years, particularly in rich countries. 
Um, and developing countries are therefore saying, well, if the G7 and others can't get their act together, um, you know, you, 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 and you need to mobilize climate finance as well as reduce fossil subsidies at home, uh, what it, what, why are you putting pressure on us? Um, so there's a massive amount of north-south mistrust at the moment, and I just came back from the Africa Climate Summit, which was actually a wonderful breath of fresh air. Uh, President Ruto of Kenya um, articulating an entirely new narrative around around the huge opportunity uh, for green growth and green jobs and the fact that Africa has half of the critical minerals and therefore has huge opportunity to contribute not just to um, its own development but to the decarbonization of the world through green industrialization. Um, and that is exactly the kind of bright spot that we need. Um, but of course, none of that will be realized without finance going to the right places. And that means beyond, um, beyond rich economies, um, which will require interventions, regulatory interventions and public finance interventions. Um, I mean, in development, developed economies, there's no shortage of money. Money is not the problem. Um, I think you saw over the summer that um, investors representing 1.5 trillion assets under management wrote to the government saying, um, that um, the weakness of um, policy signals um, and, and the current political confusion um, was actually undermining confidence in the UK as a destination for green investment. Um, and um, that is playing out in a number of places, but we're now in a competitive race. Um, I've recently been in China, and the scale of deployment of renewables there, as you all know, is e extraordinary. They are massively overachieving their targets on renewables, but at the same time, we're seeing um, a rebound in coal in China. Most of those assets will be stranded because they won't, the utilization rate will be very low, so they don't make economic sense. But we're starting to see security override even economic uh, rationale for investment in some geographies because of the very difficult uh, geopolitics. So there's a, there's a complex mix of things. Um, and into this, we're seeing actually um, really positive progress in the disclosure sector. Um, I was really happy to hear uh, um, what's happening in the UK um, um, and the minister articulate that well. But obviously all of the, the disclosure um, will create a vast amount of data, but then what do people do with it? Um, and I was just talking to my colleague this morning, in fact, about uh, the need for really high quality analysis, some of which we're supporting to help um, investors understand uh, the quality of transition plans and what they, what they really mean. Um, because we don't just need targets and, and assessment of performance. Um, governance needs to be very high quality as part of transition planning. We also need capex alignment. And for many companies, actually finance is the best forward facing indicator. In fact, by the time we measure emissions, either at national level or at corporate level, it's too late. Um, given that we have to halve emissions by 2030. So finance, in a way, is our forward-facing indicator of progress. Um, and a lot of companies and a lot of countries even are not really um, ensuring that there's really good financial alignment with the targets of Paris. And then finally, I would say lobbying. And this comes back to where we started with the, with the fossil fuel interest, which I bump into in the corridors of power everywhere all uh, around the world, trying to undo progress consistently. Um, Lobbying needs to move from negative lobbying, not just to neutral lobbying, but to positive lobbying. Um, so the companies which are really trying very hard to uh, be aligned with Paris and do the right thing are struggling often with cross-value chain problems that will require government intervention. And so we need to move from a place of lowest common denominator lobbying um, through trade associations to slow everything down to a place where companies are, as part of their transition plans, really clearly articulating, for example, where they need supportive uh, regulation, including for scope three uh, type emissions across the value chain. Um, and that would actually create a virtuous circle between uh, disclosure, analysis, decision making, transition plans and lobbying. And that's what we really need. Um, the oil industry is the furthest away uh, from making step one on that journey, but there are plenty of companies and investors who are quite a long way along, but the policy engagement piece needs work. Wow, what a brilliant um, overview of what's going on. I, I am on the Transition Plans Task Force Delivery Group, and I must say, I think we are collectively bringing together a, a really very, very coherent and what will be very consistent framework for uh, company uh, and financial sector uh, actor transition plans. Um, 
But underlying that is this kind of concern that we may be over-relying on disclosure uh, mechanisms and not enough on sort of really more muscular policy signals that really drive capital allocation into uh, green and away from high carbon. So, but we, we obviously do need transparency, we do need disclosure, we need consistency, and we're, we're going to get there, I think, but potentially without enough of that underlying kind of fundamental pull of, of capital into, um, into, into green and clean. Dan, I'd love to just pull out um, some of your perspectives from the Bank of England, which obviously an incredibly powerful institution in the economy, sending signals all the time. Um, the very fact that there's a head of climate at the Bank of England is you know, tremendous, a tremendous signal of, of where we've come. And yet, at the same time, one does feel that the Bank of England's focus on inflation, which is critical, you know, are there some tensions there between um, the policy imperative to handle uh, inflation and some of these really longer term transitions that, well, not so long term, we really need to step into them right now. I'd love your perspective on, the, on those dynamics. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And the Bank of England and central banks have um, early on collectively understood and recognized the criticality of climate change to financial stability and to the economy uh, back already in 2017, set up a collective network to um, understand, manage, and address some of these climate risks. And since then, as you've said, we've seen a number of headwinds. Some of them have been mentioned, uh, the pandemic, the war, the energy crisis now. And of course, this has to some extent uh, held back collective action, not just in the case of central banks, but across all actors. What I would say there is that um, even if that has been the case, uh, the issues that are happening in the background, climate change is intensifying, the risks are not stopping, um, and that means that um, even if the focus has to be somewhere else in the short term, we have to keep on uh, addressing climate change, and that's the focus of central banks and the Bank of England as well, Bank of England having been one of the founding members um, of this network that I mentioned. So um, the focus initially has been on financial stability and the health of the financial sy system, looking more at the risk um, side, and uh, it's great to hear also the reflections from Kate on the Africa Summit in terms of recognizing also the opportunity for growth and the impact on the economy. This is something that is more new for central banks in terms of exploring not just the financial stability implications of climate risks, uh, but also the impacts on the macroeconomy and uh, monetary stability as well. Um, and the Bank of England, the central bank in any uh, given jurisdiction is one of the actors, is a powerful lever allocating capital, shifting capital um, away from harming activities towards those that, that support and incentivize the transition, uh, but it is not the most powerful one. Um, governments are setting the pathway, financial institutions are uh, making decisions to embark on that pathway, and central banks and regulators and supervisors are supporting the tools and um, the information and the uh, direction for that to happen. Um, and that happens through a number of, of tools. We have uh, scenario analysis, stress tests across central banks, for example, uh, but also looking at uh, what further measures can be taken. And just to follow up a little bit, do, do, does the, from your perspective, is the Bank of England satisfied with how, let's say, both the insurance sector in the UK and the banking sector is doing in terms of its own transition journey? So we are constantly assessing that. We ran a climate biennial exploratory scenario a number of years ago, and we are in constant dialogue with the industry on this. Uh, we've set supervisory expectations, um, and this is being assessed. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, collective action has to some extent uh, not been as fast as we would have liked, but all the discussion that we've been having about transition plans, for example, um, is ongoing with a transition plan task force in the UK, for example, and it's not just about financing green, but it's also about how do we finance the transition itself and the activities that will enable that transition. And what we've seen in those exercises that we've run with the industry is that it's very clear that an orderly transition is what minimizes those risks and what makes the opportunities greater. Um, so even if the policy direction is not always there from government, for example, there is a collective inter interest in the financial industry to have an orderly transition. So it's in the business interest of the financial institutions in the UK and elsewhere for that to happen. Um, 
It's also, I mean, one of our perspectives at Share Actions is it's, it's in the popular interest as well. And, and, you know, millions of people across the economy have their pension funds invested in both real economy companies, but also in financial sector, um, you know, publicly listed banks, insurance companies, and so on. And it's extremely important that our, that our pension fund industry is highly enabled and has a very strong regulatory uh, signal uh, to enable, you know, as shareholder in those firms to, to really send the right signals, which can then complement what, what, you know, the prudential supervision is doing and so on. Anyway, Andrew, let's, let's come on to um, the Environmental Defense Fund's perspective on this. And it's brilliant to have someone from uh, the US on the panel because we're all kind of slightly in awe of, um, you know, some of the policy work that has... Um, uh, the Biden administration uh, has led with, um, but also some of the sort of innovation and private sector, um, you know, investment and, and, and kind of enterprise around um, really seeing the opportunity side of, of, of the transition. Can you talk a little bit about, um, from an environmental defense fund perspective, how you see that and how as, as, an, as a sort of very impressive and well-established NGO, you see the role of these different actors across the sector and, yeah. Yeah, th thanks so much. I mean, I think it's absolutely right that th this is a challenging backdrop for the energy transition. Um, and, you know, it's a volatile environment. We've seen uh, energy prices spiking. It's very easy to imagine just the opposite type of volatility where energy prices un come under huge pressure as this energy transition picks up pace. You see electrification uh, accelerating over the next several years. So th there's a lot of uncertainty around energy, um, and that makes things politically difficult. But if you look at this, what's happening with innovation right now in um, climate tech, it is really exciting. And I think in the U.S., there's a lot going on. You go to Houston right now, you know, that's the historical center for oil and gas. It's now becoming a center for climate tech, and a lot of really interesting technologies are, are, are developing there. One that we've been looking at recently is geothermal energy, which is very closely connected to oil and gas because it's really using a lot of the techniques that have come out of oil and gas fracking um, to pull heat from um, three to five kilometers uh, below the surface that can now just starting to commercially be able to generate power. Um, this is just one of so many exciting uh, new technologies, whether it's in generation and transmission and energy storage and efficiency. And I think um, that really does give you confidence that this is a wave that will start to accelerate. Um, a couple of other things that also give confidence when you look at the challenges facing the transition. Um, one is, you know, already come up uh, in our keynote of, you know, all of the key um, frameworks that are underway right now to establish, the, you know, the playing field with respect to disclosures with respect to setting targets and um, setting um, transition plans to get you from those disclosures to the targets. Um, there's an enormous amount of progress that is happening right now in, 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 in creating all of those frameworks. That's you know, incredibly hard, detailed work um, that is an iterative process, has been said. But um, essentially, without those tools, it's going to be very difficult um, to channel um, capital where this transition needs it. Um, and just the final point I'd make, a sign for optimism, is there really are still quite a lot of easy wins that are still out there as we see it um, on the way to this transition. Um, one of the examples we really focus on at Environmental Defense Fund is methane. You know, we all <clears throat> now have heard a lot about methane, the Global Methane Pledge at COP26 um, really highlighted that this is uh, another source of warming we all need to be aware of. is actually responsible for around a third of the warming we're experiencing today is actually caused by methane, not by CO2. Um, and the thing about methane is if you capture it or you prevent it leaking, um, that's just extra revenue. That's, that's money that you can actually um, sell or you make by selling that uh, captured methane. Um, but the oil and gas sector really hasn't been focused on methane. It was considered just a waste. Um, gas that you didn't need to worry about. Um, now we begin to focus on that. There's a big opportunity uh, to prevent um, those methane leaks through that focus. Um, the agricultural sector is also a huge source of methane. Um, I think that's a, an area where it's simply 
bad habits um, that have accumulated that now need to be reversed and can see a huge benefit um, from, from a, a new focus on that. I love, we were just talking before the panel about geothermal, which has got my husband completely excited, and he wants to drill a 100-meter hole in our tiny urban garden, which isn't going to happen. But uh, <laughs> these technologies are inspiring, actually, and, and, and very, uh, they're capturing people's imagination. But they're also, you know, they're not doable on a one-by-one -one basis, as we, you know, have had to realize as, as a family. You need, you, you know, they're collective solutions. You need, you know, they need to be done at scale. And so just coming back to the methane, which is a particularly interesting example, because people have been talking about methane. It's such a, as you say, it's a low-hanging fruit, but it's been around, it's not like we haven't had an analysis of that for quite some time. And yet, as you say, this, the oil and gas sector just hasn't focused on it or significantly invested in cleaning it up. And I've just... This brings me on to this theme I want to touch on for a moment before we open up for questions, which is around accountability. So, you know, ultimately, you know, over the last few years, we've seen enormous numbers of actors, whether it's companies, governments, financial sector players, you know, making these commitments and pledges, and yet um, people are not necessarily sticking to them. And I highlighted some of the big asset managers that actually have been making a very problematic backward step in terms of their climate stewardship over the last couple of years. How do we, and this is a question maybe for Kate as well, but how do we ensure that civil society, which um, I think, you know, so much of the kind of public energy um, and dynamism around the climate debate has come from the streets as well as from, you know, the corridors of power in finance um, and, uh, and in government. How do we ensure that we do hold the kind of whole nexus of actors accountable um, to what they've pledged to do? Uh, I'd love your thoughts on that, um, Andrew, and then also yours, Kate. Yeah. And, and yours, Danny, too. I'm delighted. Maybe I'll just start by saying I do think that um, civil society ne needs to raise its game in holding companies responsible to actually doing what they say they'll do. And so that does come a lot back to, if you set a net zero pledge, that's great. But unless you're actually having a plan to get there and then showing that you actually are taking those steps year by year, um, we need folks who are looking for those signs of progress and holding the companies accountable. Um, when, a, when a company announces its quarterly earnings, you have between 30 and 50 analysts on the street who are you know, scrutinizing those earnings, publishing about them, and then the whole investor community um, is then investing on that basis. Uh, in, investing on that basis. Um, you know, who is uh, doing that from a corporate sustainability pledge and climate transition pledge perspective, doing that accountability? Um, there are a few folks, um, such as Share Action, but there need to be a lot more. And I think that's a key challenge right now as this energy transition um, accelerates. Okay. Should we all use the mic, or can you hear me? Um, um, okay. Um, so, I mean, I, just to link the, the methane and accountability piece, um, so this is going to be a key discussion point at COP28, and to declare I'm um, an unpaid advisor to Dr. Sultan as part of his advisory committee. Um, and we've been having lots of conversations, as you would imagine, behind the scenes, not only with um, international oil companies, but also with national oil companies. The key indicator of whether any progress is going to be made is if the oil industry splits. And you have a vanguard group that is actually serious about near-zero methane, uh, which Dr. Sultan basically said we need to halve operational emissions of, oil, of the oil and gas sector by 2030. Uh, most of that will be achieved by zero methane, which the oil and gas industry have pledged to do many times, but yeah. not delivered voluntarily. Um, uh, and we'll have to go beyond the top actors, including Total, who are only at 40% reduction in operational emissions. So it goes beyond even the Vanguard. You would need a Vanguard group. But the idea that you know, Chevron and the National Oil Co Company of Turkmenistan um, should have the same uh, standards is, is kind of laughable. And what we need is some really fundamental technical assistance and investment in some of the, the smaller companies. So what is missing, to your earlier point, Catherine, is that disclosure and public pressure have not moved the oil industry far enough. No way. 
uh, we will need government intervention. They have failed successively to honor their methane pledges. And when it comes to national oil companies, they're essentially state assets. So of course you're going to need uh, government intervention. So I think one of the key tests for COP28 alongside the finance piece is going to be this oil and gas piece. Does the industry split? Do you have a vanguard group? Uh, are we actually finally achieving near zero methane? Is that written into countries' NDCs when they show up in Brazil for COP30? All of those pieces will be crucial. And I think it points to your point, Catherine, that accountability takes us so far, and we can't rely on our young people to transform the oil industry. Uh, we all have to take accountability, and governments have to act. Brilliant. Danai, do you want to chip in on this? On this uh, so, on, on, I think on, on accountability, it's not just the pressure that civil society brings, but also what kind of tools they have, building on what Andrew was saying in terms of the data being there, the disclosures, the transparency, and that's where central banks in the financial industry can support in terms of um, requiring those and moving ahead with, with um, the ISSB standards, for example, and um, the disclosures that we've seen, the transition plans, having um, more credible transition plans for financial industry uh, participants. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, it's really impossible to do accountability without clarity on, on who's doing what and how they're getting along. So, um, and, and, and ICIF has been fantastic in terms of supporting the infrastructure for accountability, which is so critical to all of this. Let me open up for questions, and then I, yeah, wonder if I could see a hand up there. Uh, hopefully someone will bring you a mic. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Stanislav Schmelev, Environment Euro Foundation, an Oxford-based think tank. Uh, very inspiring, but I would like to ask you the following question. It becomes very obvious that we really need a massive um, revolution in terms of the way the corporate sector approaches all these issues. Um, could you give us some examples uh, of leading companies that have completely transformed their business model, rethought, regrouped, and did something in a completely different way. Well, we, we had some examples on, on you know, uh, the, the geothermal, but I'm, I'm more curious about those who are considered to be the top companies of this world. Thank you. Does anyone want to? I mean, I, yeah. I would just say Andrew, that, that I, I would love to hear more examples. I think we all love to look at Orsted, you know, uh, probably our favorite example of an oil and gas company that's really become a renewables company. We have Neste in Finland, which is a, also oil and gas now, um, essentially a biofuels company. Um, so there are some examples of, of reinvention, but, but not enough. And just going back to the geothermal example, one disappointment is that oil and gas sector has not invested more aggressively, um, not just in geothermal, but generally in new transition technologies. You know, we have ExxonMobil threw $600 million in, into biofuels and then shut it down. It, did, it didn't really work. And I think that is maybe an example of why it's actually quite challenging for companies in um, fossil fuel sectors or in energy intensive sectors um, to really reinvent themselves around new clean energy. Um, would love to see more examples. Maybe someone here has, some, has one. Well, I'll just add in, obviously, you know, we, we, it's all very exciting and inspiring to see examples of, of companies that have utterly re reinvented their business model. But what we really need across the economy as a whole is that all companies commit to this transition. Um, and actually, a lot of that is about lots and lots of small incremental commitments and pieces. We, at Share Action, we're doing a huge amount of work on the chemical sector, a hard-to-abate sector. But the technologies absolutely do exist. It's about having the commitment, the will, and of course, once an industry like the chemical sector commits to significant decarbonisation of its operations, that's a huge signal into the fossil fuel industry for who, you know, who, on whom they rely for energy inputs. So we're interconnected, and actually, I think we shouldn't, you know, those inspiring examples are key and very wonderful, but actually, it's about, this is why transition planning is so critical and accountability for that incremental but critical movement. Yes, don't I? 
Um, not specific examples, but maybe a couple of reflections of why we're seeing so few examples. And to bring it back to the topic of the panel, which is about the economic uncertainty, and a lot of businesses still see this as a trade-off between the action they have to take uh, to move ahead with um, sustainable uh, becoming sustainable and the kind of short-term pressures that they face. And this is not just in terms of the corporate sector, financial institutions, governments. Um, there is still this perception that we... Um, are sacrificing something by moving ahead. Um, and I think that switch needs to happen, that yes, the conditions are very difficult now for businesses, for governments, but if we keep not acting, they will become even more difficult. So they're difficult compared to the past, but compared to the future, if we keep with inaction, they're actually better probably to act now than in the future. Um, and then on the technology point that we were talking about before, I think, um, yes, there's a lot of exciting prospects there, but this is not going to happen by itself. We need the kind of policy direction to set that. And um, that's something that when we look at our economic projections of kind of how, how will the transition be delivered, um, there is a lot of uncertainty there, a lot of different scenarios that we look at. And of course, technology is something that in economic models is always kind of can go different directions, but it's very endogenous in terms of how the policy determines that. Um, so the, the direction needs to be there. I think one of the key issues is that one of the values of transition planning is it gets companies to look at where their interdependencies are with others. And I think this is where we really need to unleash a new wave of policy engagement because I think the companies and some in the consumer goods sector, I see Rebecca here in the front, um, and in the tech sector and others, including in some of the hard to abate sectors, there are some front runners in cement and others. You know, when they look at their, you know, if you've got a lot of um, uh, emissions outside your direct control, how do you address that? And I think a lot of managers in businesses, they see that as outside their normal job. Um, so how do, we, how do we encourage companies to invest in their partnership capability to engage with other, um, other businesses in their value chain and with policymakers and make the case for better regulation? To your point on petrochemicals, the consumer goods industry isn't going to make any progress if petrochemicals don't make progress, right? So, so shouldn't the consumer goods sector be lobbying for regulation of the petrochemical sector? It makes perfect sense. In fact, it's almost their fiduciary duty to do so in ah. an environment of transition. Well, talking of fiduciary duty, I know that the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, which is a key sponsor of the conference, are doing... I mean, institutional investors are the, are the actors that have an overview because they, they're allocated into all of these interconnected sectors and absolutely can be drivers of this joined up thinking between sectors and, and really encourage it. And, and we're seeing it happen as well as you know, the, the, the institutional investors in the IIGCC really ramping up policy level engagement and, and, and really thinking about what are the policies we need to drive this transition in each of um, the sectors we invest in. Well, look, I, I think I've Overrun. Yes, I know I've overrun. Sorry. Um, there wasn't a kind of a big, uh, nasty red clock up here that told me that. So, um, but we've had a fascinating discussion and a really rich one. So, uh, thank you very much to all three on the panel and for engaging with us as an audience. Thank you. Thanks.